Hey guys, following up on the video from a couple of days ago where we had this spectacular pawn sacrifice with pawn to d5 for peace activity. In this example, I'm going to show you a more routine kind of pawn sacrifice for peace improvement, but that I found that, you know, for less experienced players, it's still not something that they really appreciate enough. So I think it could be useful to you. And this is a game between Alexandra Geriachkina, one of the top female players in the world, and Boris Gelfond from the 2023 European Championship. So in this position, we've got an imbalance in the pawn structure, imbalance in the pieces. White has a bishop and a knight versus two bishops. But both bishops are actually, you know, quite restricted at the moment. So you can't say blacks bishops are really living their best life. And of course, you know, white wants to jump in with their knight to that center square and take a look at further squares in black's position. So black, you know, has two approaches here, I think. One is the prophylactic approach chosen by Boris. And the second one is more like of a, you know, peace improvement approach. So what Boris did was he played f5. Interesting move, only idea, right, is just, just take away e4 from the knight. Um, and it's based on the fact that when white takes en passant and black recaptures, even though black's pawn structure is a mess here, I mean, these are very ugly, weak pawns, but they have immediate play against the d-pawn that white has a hard time defending. So, I mean, if white could put a knight on e5, black's position would probably just uh, be awful, but, um, but the knight cannot get there quickly enough, and this pawn is under attack. So it's a perfectly decent strategy, um, and it worked out well for him. He wound up winning this game. But there's another move that I think everyone um, should at least consider, and that's the move b5. And the point here is to try to get this bishop out from c8, right? So for less experienced players, they tend to not even look at this type of move if it means, like, they lose a pawn. Right? If they actually see that they're losing a pawn, they're unlikely to do it. But that's really the be not, not the end of the story, it's the beginning of the story, right? So you lose the pawn if they choose to take it, you get this diagonal. And anytime you see a diagonal like this in chess, guys, um, straight at the king, not blocked by pawns, you want to value that very highly, right? Like you want to Understand, like, it could be worth a pawn, it could be worth more than a pawn to get a diagonal like that. And if white's not careful, let's say keeps taking another pawn, black is going to get just a great position. The board is opening up for the bishops, and this bishop can be improved later on via f8. And white's attempts to maybe neutralize one of our bishops doesn't even work as a rook b4, really powerful move that protects the bishop on b7 sends the queen away, and after that you can actually take an f4 and white's whole pawn structure collapses now that the bishop on b7 is not hanging. So, of course, white can try to play more carefully. They don't have to, let's say, take the pawn on b5. They can go back to c5. And, you know, black is still the one who is, of course, you know, needing to show compensation for the two pawns that they're missing here. But they will, you know, force white to give back something right away. Like either white's going to give up the d-pawn or they're going to, let's say, go like knight d6 and give up the e-pawn. And in which case black will win the d4 pawn shortly. It's a kind of a weak isolated pawn. So... You know, this is what we call compensation, yeah? Like, you're not, like, winning as black, but certainly your pieces are becoming a lot better, and that's going to force your opponent to drop back some of their extra material. Um, in fact, as black player, I probably wouldn't be worried about this capture very much at all. I'd be more worried about moves like queen c5, where white tries to keep the position locked down for the bishops, now black would move away, trying to trap that queen. And after, let's say, knight e4, um, you know, black can take this pawn. It's a nice thing for them that they can do that. Because, okay, if they couldn't, 
Sorry about that. If they couldn't, you know, and rook d1 was coming, I mean, I would still really like white's position. But black is taking this and at least getting an extra pawn for their efforts. Um, still, you know, it feels pretty, like, pretty dangerous for black, you know, because their pieces haven't really come out and this knight can, like, sort of hop in here. But the computer was saying that, like, this is... Um, this is kind of defensible for black. Yeah, they have an extra pawn and um, that white can't exactly like win. Um, I would I would be scared though, I have to say, I'd be really scared as black playing with a bishop like that. You know, for the computer, it's okay. But in any case, guys, the, the point I'm trying to make is that you gotta consider all the options that improve your pieces. Yeah, like a bad piece is such a big problem that sacrificing a pawn in order to improve like a really terrible piece like that, it's absolutely part of routine chess strategy, right? This is not nothing shocking or special. It's just like, yes, open diagonals for bishops are certainly, um, can certainly be worth a pawn. So you want to at least consider moves like that. And you just want to um, always be very aware of your, of your bad pieces, guys. And Try to make them better as quickly as you can, right? Because for a less experienced player, you might like play moves like bishop d7. You might not really feel the urgency of that bishop, and you might be okay with like the bishop just staring into these pawns. But you know, we really don't want to um, don't want to extend or prolong the amount of time that we play with bad pieces. So I would encourage you guys to at least consider moves like that and really appreciate those open diagonals.